All righty. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ross. I'm the campus pastor out at West and part of the preaching team here at the Austin Stone, and it's just good to see you this morning. I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I really hope that the after effects of tryptophan and your uncle's unsolicited political opinions are wearing off. And I also hope and pray that you survived Black Friday with your heart and soul intact and that the inevitable post-purchase cognitive dissonance is being gentle and yet helpful with you if you didn't. I myself bought a bicycle and a doorbell with a camera in it um, so that I can see all of the people who don't come to visit. If you are new or visiting with us today, we are working our way verse by verse through the Gospel of Matthew. And we have spent the last couple of months in a bit of a series within the series as we had looked at the introduction to the Sermon on the Mount, statements that Jesus made known as the Beatitudes. They are the opening statements of the most profound sermon ever preached. They are a manifesto of kingdom happiness. In other words, Jesus literally starts his preaching ministry with a sermon series that could have been titled Your Best Life Now, except this is the Jesus edition. It hasn't looked at all as we would expect, and it didn't look at all like anyone listening would have expected. Jesus turns the values of the world upside down. And so a friend was asking me last night, are you ready to, to preach this last message in the Beatitudes? I said, I am. He said, how's it gone? I said, it's been tough. He said, oh, why? Why are they tough? I said, well, they're not actually tough to understand. They mean what they say. There's no secret hidden meaning hidden in these phrases. They're not actually tough to prep. They all have three-part structures built into them because Jesus was the greatest preacher who ever lived. And so they've got these three-part structures. They are tough, though, to live out. And they're really, really tough to believe. And so they prove tough to preach because for the preacher, we have to ask, well, do I believe this first and foremost? And am I living this out? And then we have to try to figure out ways to get that into your life in ways that you will believe and in ways that you will figure out because they're the opposite of everything that we are taught to value in this world. There are eight statements of happiness or blessing known as the Beatitudes. The first four are really about posture, about what we look like before the Lord, and the second four are really about behavior as a result of that posture. It's not clean cut, but there is a structure there. Let's just read them so we don't presume. Look at verse three of Matthew five. It says, blessed or happy or on the right path or going in the right direction are the poor in spirit. Why? for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So there's the first four. This is about the posture that you need to have that's necessary for a blessed life, for for a life full of kingdom blessing. What are those postures? Well, you've got to be poor in spirit. Jesus says, happy are those who know their spiritual poverty. Happy are those who know that they cannot actually save themselves, that they need something other than them to fix them. Those are the happiest people. Happy are those who mourn. Uh, Happy are those who go down into the lowest depths of despair because they will be comforted. And so whether you're mourning the loss of a person or you are mourning your own depravity, you can be blessed. Why? Because you get the presence of God in a way that other people don't. Happy, blessed are the meek. Happy are those who don't set themselves up to wield power for their own benefits. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those who, are, those who are satisfied will be those who desperately desire more. And so those with an insatiable desire for more of God's righteousness are the only ones who will be satisfied. It goes on. He has the behavior as a result of those postures. Verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What a promise. And then blessed are the peacemakers, 
for they shall be called sons and daughters of God. Here's the second four. It's a, the behavior that stems from this posture. Happy are the merciful. They are blessed by extending mercy as a result of having received mercy. Happy are the pure in heart. Those who live a life of singularity of affections. I love that beatitude because so much of the misery in my life is because of a disjointed heart, a heart that is not singular in its affections, a heart that doesn't just desire one thing, it desires many things and often those things are in combat with each other. That's a miserable way to live. Blessed are those who are pure in heart who live out the things that they believe, who desire a, a one thing above all other things, and that thing is God. Why? They will see him if that's their desire. And then blessed are the peacemakers, we looked at last week, for they shall be called sons of God. It's those who proactively seek peace with others as a result, that they, uh, as a result of the peace that they themselves have received. And then it gets to this week's text, and we expect, I would have hoped at least, Jesus to wrap this up by saying, and then blessed are you when you live like this and everyone will think you are awesome. Blessed are you when the world treats you and sees you as enlightened and spiritually wise because that is what the sure and certain response will be if you just live out these simple truths. But it says, verse 10, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Again, it is an upside down kingdom. It's not what we expect and it's very strange for us to read, especially in our context. Why? We live in a context in the West and particularly in the US where we are largely sheltered from persecution for our faith. Why? Well, we have worked hard to create and continue to work hard to sustain a culture and context of religious liberty and that is a wonderful gift but we have struggled to hold the necessary, listen, Christian tension of what it means to be a witness of Christ in the world. We have rightly valued love and contextual savvy as keys to reaching a world from within. We're hip within society and we'll eventually share the love of Christ with our neighbor, but we've gotta spend 15 years getting to know them first so that they will trust us. And then hopefully at some point we will be able to share. And so we're very hip and contextually savvy, but I do feel that we have failed to, prote to prepare people for the spiritual reality that the scriptures promise that the principalities and powers in the world will still hate the gospel and the messengers of the gospel regardless of how kind and gentle they are. We haven't prepped for that. And so we don't experience a lot of persecution and we really don't know what to do with it when we do. And so let's just this morning very briefly and very simply, because again, it's a simple statement, it's profound, but it's simple. It's not hard to understand what it means, it's hard to understand what to do with it. Let's just examine three statements from this text about what persecution is supposed to be for the believer. Here's how we will shape it this morning. We will say, in the life of a faithful follower of Christ, so if you wanna be a faithful follower of Christ, in the life of a faithful follower of Christ, persecution is supposed to be inevitable. Persecution is supposed to be for righteousness sake and persecution is supposed to be cause for rejoicing. It's supposed to be inevitable, it's supposed to be for righteousness sake and it's supposed to be cause for rejoicing. First one, in the life of a faithful follower of Jesus, persecution is supposed to be inevitable. Now we might read this, friends. I mean, I've been tempted to my whole life. You read this uh, statement from Jesus and you just be like, 
Yeah, no thanks. Um, that's for the elite Christian, that's for the cross-cultural missionary sort of person, and I haven't signed up uh, for that. That's for people who live in far-flung places, um, in countries that have far too many consonants in their names. Um, uh, that's for people who have seven children, all named after the minor prophets, um, who are taking the gospel to the unreached. That's for them, not for me, just regular Joe Soap living in this super hip urban context where you've got, to, you've got to really not be persecuted, you've got to just go with the flow and blend in. So Jesus, thank you, but no thank you. Well, he doesn't let us off the hook because this is a repeat theme in his teaching. Look at what he says, verse 11. Blessed are you when, not if, when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. It is expected and it is in fact required and necessary for the fullness of kingdom blessing. You wanna be blessed in the kingdom, well, then you've gotta wait for people to revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on Jesus' account. Following Jesus rightly should result in persecution of some kind, and yet we don't teach you that, and we should. If you do this well, people will hate you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Look at Matthew 10, 24 and 25. A disciple, Jesus is speaking again, a disciple, well, we love discipleship, we wanna be like Jesus, right? He's our model. I just wanna love the Lord, and I wanna live like Jesus. Great, brilliant. He has a key marker of discipleship. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, I've been called a few things on Twitter, but never that one, right? If they call Jesus a chief of demons, how much more will they malign those of his household? <laughs> so will I be persecuted? Only if you're doing discipleship correctly. If we disciple people well, they will live in a way where this will be a natural consequence. People will malign them and scorn them. Why? They did it to our Lord. Look at John 15, 20. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, now that's a conditional statement, if they persecuted me, did they persecute him? Yes, they did. Therefore, there is a consequence to that. They will also persecute you. Look how comprehensive the Apostle Paul is with this thinking in 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. And says, he says, indeed, all, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, did he stutter? Did the pen slip at that stage? I'm sure the scribe went like, did he say all or did he say some? Did he say pastors, missionaries, holy rollers, missional community leaders, maybe partners in a church, maybe the jerks for Jesus, they'll be persecuted? Or did he say, oh, it sounded like he said all. All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now if you're anything like me, then this is a little discombobulating and a little bit disheartening as well because I spend most of my life trying to avoid this very thing and trying to shelter my kids from this very thing. I have a vision of what a blessed life looks like and it doesn't look like being persecuted and mocked and scorned and shunned for my faith. It looks like everyone, regardless of their belief, thinking I am awesome all the time. That's the blessed life. But Jesus goes, well, it's not, it's not. In fact, I have realized as I have gotten older, I have realized that my number one fear is rejection. I have some other fears, legitimate ones, like sharks and styrofoam, but, but rejection is number one, all right? That stuff is no good, all right? It's from the pit of hell, both of those things, all right? Re rejection is number one. Rejection for looking foolish, I hate that. That's why I never try an activity that I don't think I'll be good at, right? I, I don't wanna look foolish. Re rejection for being backwards or judgmental. I mean, in our society, that's the worst thing that you could be. Or uninformed or old-fashioned. 
My number one fear is that people would think that I am those things and they would reject me for that. And, and I live a life where I try to follow Christ and avoid that reality all the time. And I try to do this for my kids as well. Uh, our son Daniel is, is seven. I'm trying to keep him out of sermon illustrations, but it's just part of being a pastor's kid, so sorry, but all right. Um, but Daniel is a wonderful boy. He's a sinner to be sure, all right? But he is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful little rebel against God. And um, I, I, I love him with all my heart, and he's, he, he's just such a great boy. And we went to a parent-teacher conference um, a few weeks ago at his school. He goes to a public school near our home, and, and uh, his teacher called us in, and she was waxing lyrical about this wonderful child, and I was like, I know. Um, it's, it's good parenting, I tell you, and uh, I'll write a book about it soon, because my success rate with my children is you know, like 50%. Um, and so um, I, I was just listening to all the ways he's fitted in, and all the ways he's coping with the changed curriculum, and the fact that you guys run calendars from August to July instead of January to December, which is how a calendar actually runs. Um, and so he missed a year, uh, half a year of school, and so, but he's fitted in. And then uh, his teacher's a lovely Christian lady, goes to a lovely Presbyterian church, she's a wonderful lady, but I can just tell her towards the end of the conference, she's getting super awkward, and, um, and she slides a piece of paper across the desk, and she goes, there is, there is just one, there's one thing. There's one thing. I'm like, what? Is he selling heroin? Like in the hallways? Like, you, you look concerned, right? And she slides over a piece of paper, and on it was, it was part of an assignment that he did. And, and, and um, the assignment asked a question, something along the lines of, What do you want all your friends to know? And his answer was, I want them all to know Jesus. And she said, Um, um, I know what you do for a living. Um, so don't be offended, but I have noticed um, that Daniel shares his faith all of the time at any given opportunity with all of his friends, regardless of their religious background. And I was like, and? Um, <laughs> that's chapter eight in my upcoming book, all right? Um, <laughs> and, uh, and? and I was like, is he being offensive? She was like, not at all. He's very thoughtful, he's very considerate. I said like, sorry, what is the problem? She said like, I just think kids are gonna start to reject him for this thing. And it was so kind of her to just raise that. You know what my instant instinct was? All right, we take him out. He's off to Christian school where you'll never have to share his faith, all right? Because <laughs> that's what we pay the teachers to do, all right? And so, uh, and I got home and I thought like, no, 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 no. This is the, if he gets rejected for this, Jesus says, well done. Welcome to your best life. And now you're, you're like me, you're following me, well done. We think our best life will be a life of continual acceptance from everyone. You know what Jesus calls that? He calls that a woe. In the parallel text in Luke, Jesus speaks out some woes that are the opposite of these blessings. If you've got the stomach for it, they're, they're very helpful reading. But look at Luke 6, 26, he says, woe to you, this is the counter to the blessing. So you're blessed if you're like this, and now woe unto you if you're like this. When all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. You see the, the contrast? The real prophets, they hated. The false prophets, everyone loved those dudes. And if everyone loves you all the time, woe to you, because you're missing out on a key part of the Kingdom, what? Okay, so what do we do when our lives aren't like this? Do we need to leave here and just pick some fights? Because I know some of you are all excited, right? Some of you are like, mm, at last, I'm gonna go tell some people what's what, right? Like just settle down, settle down, all right? What do we do with this? Uh, no is the short answer do we, to the question of do we just leave here and become more combative? No, I'm gonna explain that in a couple of minutes. But what do we do? Well, 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 let me give you a couple of things to consider this morning if you're saying, man, if, if it's supposed to be inevitable, that's not my reality, what do I do with that? Well, firstly, assess if your lack of any discernible persecution is a result of cowardice and compromise on your part. I've been doing that over the last couple of weeks and there's been some areas where I've had to repent. I'm <laughs> realizing sometimes I don't experience any persecution because I'm a coward and because I compromise in front of people who I know would disagree. We don't hold the tension that says we need to live missional lives of love while knowing that we will be persecuted even if and perhaps especially if 
we do that well. Some of us are placing acceptance as our highest goal and we need to turn from that. We're very quick to point out rightly how we don't want to be jerks for Jesus, but then we just default to being cowards vaguely associated with Christ. Those aren't our only two options. We have to follow our Lord who was the most gracious, the most loving, the most kind, the most enlightened and compassionate person who ever lived by far and yet was hated and persecuted his whole life. Secondly, maybe God can stir your heart this morning if you just consider this. What if we allow the persecution of brothers and sisters around the world to impact our posture a little bit this morning and to awaken our faith a little bit? Christians around the globe continue to be persecuted physically for their faith. While we meet here in downtown Austin in what is an uncomfortable room by the standards of American evangelicalism, right? Now, this is uncomfortable by American church standards, not you folks who are watching at West. You guys are plenty comfortable right now, but uh, uh, this room is uncomfortable by the standards of the US. Our minds should reflect on the hundreds uh, of thousands of our brothers and sisters who are cowered away on this day of worship in caves and dark spaces, whispering the scriptures to each other, knowing that serious consequences would await them and their families were they to be caught. It is tough to know, I'm just gonna be honest. I, I don't think Christians do themselves any favors by just making up statistics. So I'm gonna try to be faithful to this this morning. It is tough to know the stats on Christian persecution around the globe today. I spent large parts of last week trying to get some accurate studies for this one little tiny part of the sermon. Now, Gordon uh, Conwell Seminary estimates that in this century there are in the region of 100,000 Christian martyrs per year of this century. Now I must say that in a BBC article, uh, they, they debunked that number and, and they put um, a number of those deaths down to the Civil War in the Demo Democratic Republic of the Congo and they then quoted another number. I loved this article on the BBC because they said, 100,000, that's ridiculous. And so they tried to whittle it away and then they chose an, what they call would be a, an equally ridiculous low number and went with that one, but the equally ridiculous low number is alarming. Uh, they quoted the International Society for Human Rights and they acknowledged it's probably higher than this. They said that there are at least seven to 8,000 Christian martyrs every year this century. That's through the most skeptical statistics. If that is the number, that should awaken us as well. Okay, friends. Persecution is supposed to be inevitable. Secondly, persecution is supposed to be for righteousness' sake. In order to stop us from going out and picking the nearest available fight in Jesus' name, we need to consider what Jesus says persecution is and what persecution isn't. Look at the text again, verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. That's the, the cause of the persecution, or as it says in verse 11, persecuted on Christ's account. In establishing what that means, it might be helpful to remind ourselves of what that doesn't mean. Uh, look at what scholar Michael Glodlo, Glodo says about this text. He says, the suffering described here, the persecution described in this text is not the thorns and thistles of the fallen general, nor is it persecution due to hypocrisy, judgmentalism, or just general obnoxiousness. I did notice earlier that it's quite hard to say obnoxiousness without sounding obnoxious. That's just one of those mysteries of the English language. It is certainly not the imagined persecution of heightened sensitivity that has more to do with identity politics than the cost of discipleship, zing. We dare not trivialize persecution in that way when brothers and sisters are being imprisoned by oppressive regimes and dying at the hands of extremists. The suffering that is blessed here is suffering for righteousness sake, being persecuted for doing the will of our master. He raises some essential points. Christian persecution is not three things. It's not general suffering. Some things in the world just go wrong as a result of the fall that we live under. Your business deal might just blow up. It might just go south. It might be because they hate you for being a follower of Christ and it might just be as a result of the fall. Your kids 
might just rebel as a result of the fall. People might be unreasonable towards you. That might be persecution, but it might just be the result of the fall. These are all possible things, and so not everything that goes wrong in our life is a result of persecution. Maybe you didn't fail the exam because your, your um, atheist lecturer is unreasonable and persecuting you for your faith, especially since your exam wasn't on your faith, it was on the topic that you didn't study, and that might be the general reason that you failed that exam. Uh, secondly, persecution is not opposition to being unloving or unwise. Maybe people distance themselves because you were kind of jerky to be around. Maybe you got overlooked for promotion because you were sinfully lazy at work. Maybe you lost followers online because you are insufferable online. I'm putting it out there. Maybe you got a speeding ticket because you were speeding. Not all of these things are persecution. Some of these things are the result of our own sinfulness and folly. And then lastly, persecution is not political paranoia or political power mongering. We are so set out, friends, it's been alarming to me. I've been in the US for 11 months now. It's been alarming to me how tied in Christendom is with identity politics in the US. We are so set out and committed to identity politics that we hold many of our political views as gospel and then view our pursuit of Christ as the thing under attack when someone holds a contrary political view. <laughs> Maybe they just hold a contrary one and it might be a dumb one. It very likely is and should be argued on that basis. It is not necessarily an attack on your faith. Politics itself is the more dangerous attack on our faith. Let's be wise. So those are things that we aren't being persecuted for righteousness sake. What is it to be persecuted for righteousness sake or even on Christ's account? Well, remember the fourth beatitude, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. This is the same word for righteousness. And when I, I taught this a, a few weeks ago, we said that this righteousness is a righteousness for us, it's a righteousness from us, and it's a righteousness around us. It's a desire to be in right standing with God, a desire to live in a right way because of that right standing with God, and then it's a desire to see society put to rights as a result of our right standing with God. It's when we pursue those things and are persecuted for those things, right standing with Christ, right standing from us, living holy lives, and then right standing with society, bringing about justice and mercy. When we are persecuted for those things, then we are persecuted on account of righteousness. It is essentially to be persecuted for living out the Beatitudes, for following Christ in word and deed in a way that leads to opposition. Now you might ask, wait, wait a second, why on earth would living as poor in spirit and meek and desiring righteousness and merciful and pure in heart and as a peacemaker, why would these things bring persecution? The truth is, they will. Why? They fly in the face of what the world wants and pursues and protects. And if you pursue them, the world will think you're daft and it will resist you. Jesus was the fulfillment of righteousness and everywhere he went, people wanted to kill him. If you are poor in spirit, it will expose others as full of pride and they will resist you. If you mourn your sin, it will expose the self-righteousness of others and they will resist you. If you are meek, it will reveal the brutality of those filled with, with power and self-seeking and self-serving. If you are merciful, you will reveal injustice in society. If you are pure in heart, you will come across as a holy roller. You will. If you are a peacemaker, you will definitely draw the fire of both peacekeepers and aggressors. You'll draw the fire of both of them. Jesus was persecuted for living like this, and we will be. This is why we would do well to consider and count the cost of following Christ. Friends, I haven't experienced a lot of persecution as a believer, but I have been mocked, I have been reviled, and I have sadly lost friendships whenever I have pressed further into what it looks like to follow Christ faithfully. As Christ has awakened a desire for purity and heart in me, it has revealed 
the divided hearts of some people around me, and as I have naturally pressed in, they have pulled back. Why? Christ has awakened a purity in hearts in me that they don't yet have, and so they resist and push back. You decide, hey, because of my purity in heart that Christ is awakening in me, I'm not gonna drink with you as much as I used to. Watch how that will go. Do you think people will go, man, that's enlightened. You just be you, that's awesome. What will they say? You're saying I drink too much? You judging me now, that's you now? That's the inevitable consequence, regardless of how lovingly you do that. Okay. Persecution is to be expected, it's inevitable. Persecution is for the sake of Christ. Lastly, persecution is supposed to be cause for rejoicing. Jesus says, hey, when this happens, rejoice. Why? Well, three quick reasons amongst others, and then I'll get out of your hair because some of you feel like I'm persecuting you right now. All right, first one, persecution unites us with Christ. This is why we should rejoice. It's an experience we get to share with Christ unlike any other. We get to experience the nearness and the fellowship of Christ in a special way when we are persecuted for our love of him. Don't you love that? When you are persecuted, you can go to Christ and you can go, oh, I remember how that felt. That one I know. And you get to feel his nearness in a special way. Paul said it this way in Philippians 3 when he spoke of his greatest desire, he says, he has my greatest desire that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Everyone's like, "Mm, yes, that's going on a bumper sticker, maybe in another language so that I don't look like a freak in Austin, but, but, but that is, I wanna know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings. Hey, oh, what? This is part of what it means to know him, becoming like him in death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. You will know Christ in a very special way if you are persecuted for him and with him. Secondly, rejoice, because persecution connects us with the saints of old. We live with an extreme chronological arrogance where we think our generation is the most important thing that ever happened, but it's important for us to stop and remember that this is a multi-generational faith that we are part of. And as we worship today, we, we, we in a way are cheered on by the generations that came before us in accordance with the writer of Hebrews. Jesus ties this back to the prophets of old. He goes, you're in great company. You're with John the Baptist and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Habakkuk, you're in great company with these cats, rejoice. It's always been the case for people who follow God boldly, the world won't get it. And in fact, listen, sometimes the church won't get it. The prophets were usually persecuted by the covenant people of God, not by the Philistines. You might, friend, take shots from Christ followers for following Christ more fervently. You will, in fact. You should watch Christian Twitter, which is a terrible descriptor because Twitter cannot be saved. But Christian Twitter, there is nothing Christian about it. What you will see is followers of Christ ridiculed by other apparent followers of Christ for living out the Beatitudes. Why? It exposes the hypocrisy of other supposed followers of Christ. And they attack. I love the reminder in Hebrews 11. Look at this. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, not, not that fun type, the, the, no, the worst type. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. They died before they got to see it. Why? Since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. When we are persecuted for the gospel, we perfect the bride of Christ and are added to this great number that have gone before us. So rejoice. Lastly, Rejoice because persecution secures reward in heaven. What a thought. Jesus says not only do you get to see the kingdom of heaven, but you get reward. When you get there, it gets even better. 
<laughs> you get mocked now, sure. You get a crown then. Get ridiculed now, sure. You'll rule over cities then. You lose out now, fine. You will win forever then. Have people turn from you now, okay. You will stare in the face of your king on that day. It's worth it. Look at how the apostles responded to beating and imprisonment in Acts 5, 41. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Will we be counted worthy? We live in the most comfortable, most convenient, most affluent place in the world to try and be a follower of Christ. And we buffer our lives away from the realities of ever having to be persecuted. And Jesus says, woe to you for that. Okay. Feeling a bit defeated. I was when I prepped this message, I was like, whoa, man. Maybe if I just go be a jerk in my neighborhood for a while and people shout back, then I'll feel better. Um, but I won't because that won't be for righteousness sake. How do we not get defeated by the Beatitudes, which are so very unlike us? Well, we remember our King, who ultimately is the fulfillment of these Beatitudes on our behalf and covers up all of our shortcomings and yet still invites us again and again into greater blessing, into greater kingdom life. Since he became poor, ours is the wealth of the kingdom. Since he mourned with tears, we have the warmth of God's comfort. Since he lost everything, we inherit the earth. Since he cried out, I thirst, we can be satisfied. Since he is merciful, we can receive mercy. Since he is ultimately pure of heart, your heart can be made new. Since he is the prince of peace, we don't have to be overcome with anxiety. Since he was persecuted on the cross, we can have resurrection life and face whatever comes next, even if that is the inevitable persecution of people who hate our kingdom life. And this new kingdom life is marked by mercy. It enjoys purity, it pursues peace, it endures persecution and lives with a blessed contentment of being citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Friends, examine your life. He promised us it's inevitable. He told us why it would happen. And then he said, rejoice. Let's be people who pursue him so vehemently, so thoroughly that we don't fear the guaranteed isolation rejection and persecution that will come as a result. Father God, thank you so much for your word. I pray that we would not just be hearers of the word this morning, but that we would be doers too. Lord, I asked at the start of the sermon that you would open our eyes to the truth of these scriptures. Oh, I pray that you do that and are doing that. Lord, this is not the way we would want to live for ourselves. This is not the way that we would seek blessing. And yet it is the way your son promises is the way to the best life. Awaken us. God, forgive me for having an idol of acceptance and people pleasing. I confess that that often stands in the way of me sharing truth and living out my faith in the way that I ought to because I fear rejection and persecution. Forgive me. God, forgive us if that's what we're doing. Father, forgive us for sitting here in a room forgetting about our brothers and sisters who face death today for the right to be able to read the scriptures and sing to your son. Forgive us. Awaken us. 
And then God sent us out as citizens of this kingdom armed with the gospel, living out these beatitudes. Don't protect us from persecution. Embolden us. Embolden us. So that we don't settle for a life of woe. Where the people of earth accept us all the time and we miss out on the true blessing of being citizens of the kingdom. Awaken your church in Jesus' name, amen.